The Kia Seltos is yet another option in a flurry of compact SUVs. It sits in between the Sonnet and the Sportage, and this 2024 model has now been updated. So let's find out what has changed. On the outside, the front bumper has been revised, as well as the headlights which use LED lighting technology. The same applies to the taillights, which now feature an LED light strip which runs across the boot. It's the interior of the updated Saltos that is most impressive to me. This being the GT Line spec, we do have two-tone leather with white stitching, and we've got all-round good quality materials, and you can feel that this car is very well built. The most impressive feature for me, however, has got to be this touchscreen infotainment system, which uses a curved screen and integrates the digital instrument cluster. And overall, you've got a very upmarket cabin with this updated Saltos. Backseat occupancy can be a contentious issue when it comes to compact crossovers, because many of these vehicles promise to be these amazing family cars, but then you sit at the back and you're quite disappointed in terms of space. But I can tell you that in the case of the Saltos, it does not disappoint whatsoever. In terms of legroom space and headroom space, I am covered, and I know I'm not the tallest person out there, but as you can see by how I'm sprawled, people can sit here quite comfortably at the back. And the good thing is that you've also got two USB-C points so that you can happily charge your phone and no one can fight about who's charging when. The same goes with boot space because this car offers you a lovely 433 liters so that family excursion for the weekend won't be a problem in the Saltos. It's amazing to think that in 2024, brands such as Kia are now known as trusted brands in our country. Whereas a few years ago, these brands were treated the same way that we treat Haval and Cherry and Omoda. But so much has changed since then, and these cars have become better and better with time. And now, Kia is perceived as a more premium brand in our country. With regards to this updated Saltos, the biggest change from a powertrain perspective has got to be the addition of two engines. On the one hand, we've got a normally aspirated 1.5 litre, and on the other hand, we've got a turbocharged 1.5 litre, which I'm currently driving, and this car is mated to a seven-speed dual-clutch transmission. Of late, however, we've seen many brands transition from having dual-clutch transmissions to conventional torque converter automatics. And that makes a lot of sense because, in my opinion, the torque converter automatics are much smoother, whereas DCT transmissions tend to be a bit jerky, especially at lower speeds. In the case of the Saltos, I have experienced some jerkiness in my day-to-day -day driving experience, and it doesn't take away much from the overall experience of the car, but it is apparent and sometimes rather annoying. It is made up for, however, by the engine because this 1.5 turbo is very punchy. It produces 118 kilowatts and 253 newton meters. This Kia feels very planted on the road and it instills a sense of confidence for the driver. Mated to the engine that this vehicle has as well, you can have quite a spirited experience when you're driving this specific model. What I do like about the Kia Seltos range as a whole is how complete it feels. One thing about the Chinese automakers is that as nice as their cars are, at times the calibration of their vehicles leaves much to be desired. There's often too much wheel spin and the vehicle feels like it doesn't communicate with the driver as well as you'd want it to be. Whereas in the Seltos, it feels like a lot of development was made ensuring that the driver and the vehicle are always in sync. So if I want to take a quick gap, I simply squeeze the throttle and the car responds accordingly. When Kia's fleet manager asked me if I want to drive the normally aspirated variant with the CVT gearbox or the turbocharged variant with the dual clutch transmission, I quickly said, let me drive the DCT. But on further thought now, I would love to have experienced what the CVT feels like because CVTs, as much as we dog them as journalists, have come a very long way 
and at times you don't even notice that the vehicle has got a CVT gearbox. The other drawback that comes with driving this model is that it is the top of the range GT line spec and this car will cost you just over 660,000 Rand which is a lot of money within this segment. In fact it's a lot of money whichever way you look at it. The good news is, if you do decide to opt for a lower spec derivative of the Kia Saltos range, you are looking at roughly 468,000 Rand starting off, which isn't bad. And the good thing with Kia is that they do offer you a decent amount of spec, even if you don't go for the top variant in the lineup. Overall, there's very little to fault with the facelifted Kia Saltos range. The only problem that this car faces is the competition within this segment. There is a lot to choose from and you can't fault consumers for looking at the Chinese brands because those cars do offer a lot of bang for buck. However, if you're looking for something that you can potentially trust a bit more because they've been around for longer, it makes perfect sense to go for a car such as this. Welcome back to Ignition GT. Before the break, I gave you my driving impressions of the upgraded Kia Saltos and now it's time to find out if our guests have been won over by the Korean company's latest SUV offering. You know, it's weird. As journalists, we all know that feeling when a vehicle mm. works and when it doesn't work. And that car for me was one of those. We'll start off with Nikki. What did you find? It's a brilliant product. I mean, I think we can all agree that last year when the Sportage came out, it was such an awesome car. And I feel like he has done it again with the Saltos. Mm. Um, they've got good offerings. There's a lot of offerings as well. But I mean, all the way from its base spec to its range topping GT line, it's a brilliant product and it definitely shook me. Yeah, I can understand. I can understand. And you know what impressed me the most? I had mm. the top of the range spec. That interior was very nice. That two-tone leather mm. had, you know, the little quilts and the stitches and all that. It actually felt much more upmarket for a vehicle that is actually a little bit of a baby SUV in the Kia range, mm. right? What were your thoughts? What stood out for me, apart from the spaciousness of the interior and the, the equipment and how they've um, realigned the infotainment screen as well, is the engine. I mean, that um, 1.5 TGDI is a huge improvement over the old 1.4. Not the old 1.4 was bad, but I mean, we both agree that engine, when you hit it, it absolutely went. And it is so well calibrated with that uh, seven speed uh, double clutch gearbox. Yeah. That was one of the standouts for me. And when we, we stuck it in sport mode a couple of times, the yeah. pass in uh, uh, Solaris pass mm. in the Cape, it went and it didn't, there was no hesitation mm. from the gearbox from what we experienced. It didn't abruptly shift down or anything. Mm, mm, and it, mm. because it's got that amount of torque, it, it doesn't feel lazy or anything. Yeah. So, um, yeah, much, much better accomplished, I think. Mm. Lastly, now, pricing. Mm. Obviously, we know the GT line, we're looking at roughly, what, in the mid-600s. It's, it's mm -hmm. not a cheap mm. car, yeah. but, you know, there's a lot going for it at the same time. Um, if we're looking at the GT line, I think it does find itself in a bit of a difficult spot. It's, mm. like you said, a 600k mark is quite a difficult one. Yeah. I think where it will definitely excel is in its lower range. Looking mm. at the LX, for example, mm. uh, I believe that's priced relatively fairly. And then Kia did a good job with the entry model actually being priced a couple thousand rand less than its outgoing predecessor. So that's quite good. Um, but yeah, if you're looking at GT line, it's it's got a lot of spec, it is very nice, mm. but at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself the question, do I need all of this? That's the thing. Because you get a lot of it in the LX, mm. and the LX is a fantastic model. It's got all the modern tech that you would need. Mm. Might not be the latest and the greatest, but it does the job, and I think that's where it would excel on the lower end. Mm. Final thoughts on the car? Anything that would you be the pick of your bunch, by the way? So, I think it would definitely be on my shortlist, yep. you know, looking at like LX and possibly an EX. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. Good point. Yeah, I like that. It's a very diplomatic answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. I think <laughs> if I were to choose that, it would probably, and we, we spoke about this on the launch as well, that mm -hmm. um, as nice as the GT line is, and it punches really hard, and it's good to look at, and it comes with a bunch of exterior stuff that you don't get on the lower models, maybe a EX Plus, the diesel, 
but with 1.5 diesel, oh, yeah. that would be the probably the ideal one. But as Nikki said, if you look at the the base Alex, which is what we drove, we had GT line and we drove the the Alex. Mm. You're not missing out for for anything when it comes to equipment. There are subtle differences, of course, but mm. it is absolutely stocked. Mm. And I think that diesel would be the one that'll that'll probably hit the sweet spot, given with how petrol is and so on. Ooh. So that would yeah. definitely be the one to go for. <laughs>